Good morning. Uh, my name is Clayton. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Reunion, uh, and I'm really glad that you guys tuned in with us this morning. Uh, Reunion is a family of churches all across the Boston area with the simple mission of helping people find their way back to God. And our hope is that this community, this family of churches, uh, can become a family for you as well, uh, and a place of authentic belonging for you, and a place where um, people in this community can walk alongside you on your journey. If you're new here, maybe you're just checking out this church thing for the first time, or, or maybe the first time in a long time, uh, I would encourage you, I would love for you to go to our website, uh, reunionmovement.com, and click on the chat bubble in the bottom right-hand corner that says connect with us. That's going to be the best way to engage, going to be the best way to get plugged into the reunion family. Uh, but you can also find us on social media, that's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter throughout the week. Uh, and all of that information is going to be in the, the chat feed uh, next to your video screen. Uh, this morning, kind of the way things are going to go, uh, we're going to have a, a time of worship with Jessica and Bailey, uh, followed by some very brief announcements, and then Nathan is going to share a message with us. Uh, and after that, we'll wrap up with a time of communion, uh, as well as a closing song and a benediction. So without further ado, Jessica and Bailey. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. So let's sing and worship together this morning. You make me brave. You make me brave. You make me brave. You call me out beyond the shore into the waves. You make me brave. You make me brave. No fear can hinder now the love that made away. You make me brave, you make me brave, you call me out beyond the shore into the waves, you make me brave, you make me brave, no fear can hinder now the promises you made, and as your love
crashes over me, crashes over me. For you are for us, and you are not against us. Champion of heaven, you made a way. And as your love in wave after wave crashes over. Crashes over me, for you are for us, you are not against us. Champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in. is built on your faithfulness my hope is held in your promises I take each step with your confidence I am yours I am yours you never fail you never will I'll trust your name For greater things You will come through You always do I'll trust your name For greater things Good morning, Reunion. I'm Leslie Jackson, one of Reunion's elders and a part of the South End community. 
I'm so excited that you all joined us this morning online. I just want to highlight a few announcements. First, I want to remind you that you can help support the work and mission of Reunion by giving online. Thank you to everyone who has been generous during this season. We always say this is a get to, not a have to. It's something to get to participate in as you come to know and love the mission of Reunion. We should have a link in the chat of where to give, but you can give on our website, reunionmovement.com. Your generosity is what allows us to care for our community in tangible ways. So thanks for joining us on our mission endeavors. We know there are people in our reunion family who are in need and are struggling, especially during this season. Please reach out to us and let us know your needs. We'd love to be a blessing to you. Next is Grief Share. Reunion is starting a formation group called Grief Share. Grief Share is a weekly support group for those who have lost a spouse, child, family member, or a friend. The group will be led by caring people who have experienced similar grief and will walk with you on the long path through grief toward healing and hope for the future. If you're interested in learning more, signing up, or having a conversation about your grief journey, text GRIEF, G-R-I-E-F, to our text number, 617-415-4466, or email info at reunionboston.com. And our group leader will reach out to you. The starting date and time have not been finalized as we hope to find a time of the week that works best for everyone who is interested in participating. Another item is Fifth Sundays. I know many of us don't even know what day it is, never mind the week, but May has five Sundays in the month. At reunion, usually we spend that morning serving or learning more about our partners and communities. This upcoming Fifth Sunday May 31st, we are excited to spend that morning hearing from experts and partners share about the impact COVID-19 is having on the issues of housing, education, foster and adoption, the lack of adequate food and racism. We're also excited for them to share some tangible ways that our community can help. We hope you will join us. Now, I'm going to turn things off to Nathan as he shares with us this morning. God bless you all. Hey, Reunion. I'm so excited to be with all of you this morning. Uh, if you don't know me, something I want you to know about me, when I was in college, uh, I played soccer. And my sophomore year in college, I decided that I was going to be just like my favorite soccer player, a guy by the name of Cristiano Ronaldo. And I decided I was going to study his moves. I started watching his games. I tried to mimic how he played the game, but I was going to take it a step further. I actually went and got the same haircut that he had. And at the time, he had like this faux hawk, mohawk thing. And in the back, he had really, it was like almost a mullet, essentially. And I went and got as close as I could to the exact same haircut. And after I did that, I want to tell you something that I learned. I learned really quickly 
that you can pull that off if you're a world-class athlete. If you were a random sophomore at a random college in Missouri, you can't really pull that off as well. But I, I just so badly wanted to be like him, right? And I don't know, maybe you've been there. I mean, have you ever just desperately wanted to be like someone? You know, in first century Jewish culture, Jewish boys around the time that they were probably five or six years old, they would go to their local synagogue. And there they would be trained by a rabbi, a teacher uh, in that synagogue. And they would begin to study the Torah. And Torah is translated a lot of times like teachings or the way, but really the Torah is the first five books of the Old Testament. And this process, it, it lasted until they were around the age of 10. And at that point, most of the Jewish boys had the Torah memorized, the entire first five books of the Old Testament. And many students from here, they would be sent home to learn their family trade or continue with the family business, but the best of this group would be invited into this next stage. In this next stage, they would memorize the entire Old Testament. And this process lasted until they were probably around the age 13 or 14. And after this, the best of the best would go on and be invited to apply to a rabbi. They would ask to be one of the rabbi's disciples. And becoming a disciple, it was an incredible honor. See, for us, when we hear that word disciple, we think a lot of a student or someone who learns the things that their teacher learns. But it was such a deeper reality at this time. A disciple, they didn't want to just know what their teacher knew. They wanted to be like their teacher. They wanted to be sent out and the rabbi to say, I believe you can do what I am doing. And it's from this system that reunion has developed some of our language around what it means to be an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus. See, our hope is not simply that you would know who Jesus is or even that you would know a lot of information about Jesus. Our hope is that all of us are discovering Jesus so that we can become like Jesus and that we can do what Jesus did. And it brings up an important question I want to ask you this morning. What is something in your life that you could change that would make you more like Jesus? And please understand, this isn't something that I'm asking you to answer in the chat. This is a question I'm asking for your own self-reflection, but my guess is Many of us have asked this question of ourselves before, and some of us ask it often. What do we need to do? How do we need to reposture our lives or reorient our lives so that we can be more like Jesus? And this, it's not, it's not a new question. Actually, as we jump into this new series that we're kicking off this morning called Become Like Jesus, and over the next few weeks, as we dive into and unpack this book of Philippians, we're going to start to realize that this was a question the church in Philippi, or this church that this letter was written to, is a question they were asking. It's really interesting. Paul, who is kind of like a spiritual mentor to this church, he writes this letter, and as he does so, he's sitting in prison. He's waiting for a trial. And at this point, he's bounced around prisons and trials and house arrest. And if I had his life, just honestly, I would feel defeated, right? I mean, can you imagine bouncing around prisons, being beaten, facing execution over and over again? It's not how I would have envisioned my life when I became a follower of Jesus. I just, I just feel defeated. And he's writing to this church, and the church he's writing to has this unique culture that they are in the middle of. See, the land of Philippi, Philippi excuse me, is, is given to retiring soldiers from the Roman army a lot of times. And so it's easy to say that it was a military town, but really it was this town that had this rich history and heritage of victory. I mean, you can almost imagine, right, former soldiers and from the Roman army they're sitting around and they're exchanging war stories. They would have talked about their victories, right? They would have spoken about territories that they took by force. 
They would have remembered times that they stood across the battlefield from a larger army, but through Roman force and through Roman might, they prevailed. It would have been something that was flooded within their culture. They had this tradition that was steeped in war, in this belief that it was force and it was power that were the clear markers of victory. And then they get this letter. And in it, Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. I mean, can you imagine hearing that from someone in prison? What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I mean, you see what he's doing? Because he's looking at this culture and he's saying, you think you understand victory? And you're looking at me and you're seeing me in jail and you're seeing me in chains and you're thinking Paul's defeated, but actually, this is victory. He goes on to write, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far what's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on accounts of me. I mean, you understand how countercultural this is, right? How countercultural this would have been to the people living in the city that he was writing to. I mean, not only is he in chains, not only is he uncertain of what's going to happen next, but he's saying to them that actually death is not the ultimate defeat. Death is not the complete absence of victory like they assume it to be. You see, Paul's identity, it was so wrapped up in becoming like Jesus that he actually redefined what victory is and what winning is, because for him, victory was being renewed to become like Jesus. To him, winning was helping others become like Jesus so that the gospel was advanced. I mean, he really says it in such a beautiful way when he writes, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. See, winning for Paul was being with Jesus, or it was advancing his name. And he shifted his view of victory because ultimately he followed a God who flipped victory on its head. See, in the life of Jesus, we see this upside down reality because victory is found in the humbling of oneself. Winning is found in stepping off a throne in heaven to enter into the fray of humanity, to walk with humanity through brokenness and through hurts and through pain. Victory is found in the humbling of yourself and the serving of others. Winning is found through death on a cross. And Paul understood this. That's why he says, if you want to know what it means to be like Jesus, then you have to be so wrapped up in him, so diligently pursuing him that it changes your view of what victory is. Because to the watching world, Paul was losing. In a culture used to winning through power and through force, Paul showed a different way. And to his community in Philippi, They felt like they were losing, right? Roman occupation was their reality. They're watching their mentor and their friend suffer in chains, most likely getting executed, and they're wondering if they're going to face a similar future. It feels like they're losing. What about you? I mean, do you feel like you're losing right now? 
Because honestly, I do. I mean, each day is a battle with mental health, with family relationship dynamics, with bills, with social distancing, with an unknown future. But in Christ, we are promised that even when it feels like we're losing, there is hope because the kingdom is still at work. See, faith in Jesus, it redefined winning. What if quarantine was actually a time when the church can demonstrate hope and grace and love? What if in the midst of a global pandemic, the gospel was actually thriving because for us, living was Christ? We reoriented our lives so that we began to live for the sake of God's kingdom in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Last week, uh, Chris mentioned that we have tried to update some of our language and some of our ideas that we're sharing when it comes to the practice of blessing our neighbors. And really the hope of all of that is it is just a reminder for all of us that even in the midst of everything that is going on, we can and should still bless our neighbors. We should hope the gospel moves forward. Today though, I actually want to invite you to commit to doing that. I wanna invite you to become a neighborhood ambassador. I mean, what might happen if we committed to blessing our neighbors? What might happen if the greater Boston area was covered in neighborhood ambassadors who were loving and serving in the name of Jesus? And we wanna help you get started. Right? We wanna give you a neighboring packet. And this packet's gonna have some of that updated language and information when it comes to blessing. It's gonna have a neighboring journal if you don't have one with you. And it's gonna have a card that you can print out that is something that you can put on your neighbor's door that uh, might have your name and your number and maybe just some basic ways that you wanna offer help. Things like offering to pick stuff up when you go to the grocery store. Things like just offering to have emergency supplies, like if someone runs out of toilet paper last minute, right? Maybe just saying, hey, feel free to text me. I know this is a lonely time and I wanna be a friendly person that you can text. And we actually want you to text in and let us know that you're doing this because we wanna make a map. We wanna have this amazing visual, this amazing picture of our neighborhoods and our cities and all of the greater Boston area being covered by ambassadors that are proclaiming the grace of the kingdom of Jesus. Because when we bless our neighbors in the midst of COVID-19, we are doing exactly what Paul was talking about in Philippians. So right now, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to grab your phones, and I want you to text NEIGHBOR to 617-415-4466. And that's gonna be in the chat uh, during this time, but I'm actually gonna pause and I'm gonna invite you to do that with me right now. I mean, what if every neighborhood in our city had an ambassador that was helping spread the love and the grace of the kingdom of God? What if in this season where it feels like losing, the gospel was actually thriving? See, as disciples of Jesus, we become more like Jesus. We become more like our rabbi, when we extend his love to our neighbors. Let's pray. God, in this season where losing might be just an overwhelming feeling that a lot of us are experiencing, help us remember hope. 
Help us see hope in you and help us extend that love and that grace and that hope to the world around us. We thank you that we can become like you, that you have modeled for us what it looks like to live and to move and to breathe in this world with grace. And I pray that all of us continue this process of becoming like you. We love you. Amen. Uh, we're going to come now to a time that we call communion. So if you have uh, some kind of element, something that can represent uh, blood or bread, excuse me, and represent juice, I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab those now. And in this moment, I just want to remind us that when we look at the cross, for so many people, as they watched Jesus on the cross, they thought he was losing. And yet three days later, when the tomb was empty, we can realize that in truth he had already won. And in that, in our darkest moments, in those moments where defeat has felt like it has won already, we can be reminded that there is hope because victory lies ahead because of the victory that already happens in that empty tomb. So if you have those elements, let's all go ahead and take communion together. Death and life, I follow you in every season. This be true, I chose this path and I made this vow, and I will never turn around. Oh, nothing can hold. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I give it all for love's true name. It brands my heart, and now I will rise to bear the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, nothing can hold. I find my joy in bringing you praise. I will obey you.
I find you my joy in bringing you praise. Let's close now with a benediction. May you depart knowing the invitation of God to move from control to trust, from what we know to what we have yet to discover, from where we've been to where we have yet to go, and from a place of comfort to a place of risk. Go now in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who said, follow me, without saying where he was going, just promising transformation and relationship with the triune God along the way. Live this week praising the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and live the church.